What up? You're listening to the True Conversation Podcast, presented by Volcom. I'm your host, Fat Tony. For this episode of True Conversation, we further explore representations of black women in surf with the veteran experience of Sharon Schaefer and Mary Mills, plus Gigi Lucas, a founder of the nonprofit Surfier Negra. Here to discuss how new generations will be represented in surf. Hey, what's up? This is me, Fat Tony. It is I. Welcome back to True Conversation, uh, the Vulcan <laughs> podcast that we love. We got some OG surfers in here today. Woo! On a past episode, we had Textured Wave, so it was only right that we holler at y'all, too. And Gigi, you have a connection to Textured Waves because you're one of the founders, right? Yeah, one of the original co-founders. Yeah. Crazy. Hi, Gigi. Hey, Sheriff. You're a negra. <laughs> Sorry, no, I'm, I'm getting. Really no, 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 no. Is it okay to talk freely, reunion. or are we on a format type of thing? We, is it okay to speak flowing, freely? man? It's, oh, because I free. just want to say to Gigi or everyone actually that you know I'm still learning to put together the names with the handles. So your actual name with your Instagram uh, uh, handle. So <laughs> I've been like admiring Surfier Negra, and we've been having our little love fest. But I didn't necessarily know right off the bat that. That was Gigi Lucas. So then oh, when really? told me yesterday, I was like, ah! I was like all geeking out. I was like, oh my God, okay. <laughs> and then really happy to see my old buddy, Mary. Hey. So, uh, yeah, I'm really excited, you guys. <laughs> I'm sweating too. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Gigi, what is that? What is that Instagram she's talking about? So it's actually my nonprofit, Circa Negra. And that's the main reason why I wasn't able to really continue with Texture Waves is because it's a 501c3 that focuses on getting the next generation of girls of color into the water. Tell me about it. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I set you up. up. <laughs> <laughs> no, so yeah, it's, it was founded in 2018 and um, was birthed out of the fact that I was living in Costa Rica for five years surfing and really didn't see women who look like me in a lineup. And so, <laughs> thank you, Mary. And so, um, originally it was gonna be like a concept similar to Textured Ways, but then I thought like, you know what? it's not necessarily about women who have the confidence to get in the water. It's about reconnecting the next generation and like breaking down the stigmas um, and reconnecting our people with the ocean. So right now we have two major programs. One is called the hundred girls program. It's a fund that literally sends a hundred girls to surf camp every oh, summer. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I'm, I'm the girls are, are so, ah, they're amazing. And then um, 2021 we're launching surf the turf, which is literally, democratizing in the most responsible way possible the, the sport of surfing. So, yeah. And like the, the thing that I love though, and this is why I'm so happy to be on the panel with Mary and, and Sharon, and thank you Fat Tony for having us, is because like I tell these girls about these ladies all the time because mm. like their stories aren't front and center. And um, like I get geek when I talk, and like I'm actually here on the panel with them. So I'm like, I have to slap the smile on my face, but it's, uh. <laughs> I, it's, I can't help it. <laughs> Man, let's uh, get into it. I want to know about y'all's history. Mary, tell us by yourself where where you're from. How'd you get into surfing? I'm from Los Angeles, and I fell in love with surfing. Okay, Gigi's too young to remember. You're too young to remember. But Sharon and I remember Wide World of Sports, and that's where I saw surfing, and I was just captivated. But I couldn't swim and had straightened hair, so... As far as I knew, I was never going to surf. And then fast forward many, many years, at 23, I wanted to start doing triathlons. So I cut my hair off, learned how to swim, started doing triathlons. Crazy. Still didn't surf, could swim like a fish, still didn't surf. Fast forward to when I was 38 and was a competitive cyclist. There was a table along the beach bike path for surf lessons. And I thought, now I'll surf. But there was a little voice in my head that said, no, you won't, you have to wait. <laughs> Turns out I was pregnant. Whoa, that was the voice. Yeah. So three months after my son was born, then I started taking those classes. And the rest is history. Crazy. Nice. Sharon, what about you? Me? Yeah, oh. how'd you get into it? Oh my goodness, wow. Well. Wee! Um, <laughs> 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 no, 
that's lengthy. That's action packed. That question. Um, I got Give into. Give it to it. me. I'm, yeah, I'm giving it to then. you. Well, you know, I'm 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 very blessed to have had a family and a father who wanted something more for his girls than to play basketball and and run track. Not that there's anything wrong with those things, but he would had a very huge imagination. Just and he just saw the world as our oyster. But he also knew that he was the father of five little black girls, and they were going to have to be better. 10 times better, faster, smarter at everything they did if they were going to succeed in this world. So he had us out horseback riding, English jumping. He had us out gymnastic classes. He had uh, bought a unicycle for Christmas and everybody looked at that thing like they were, you know, like he was, he was crazy. But I took that thing. I rolled myself around the block, uh, standing up against the wall until I could ride that damn thing. So that kind of was the birth of me as this kind of eclectic athlete person who happened to be kind of multi-skilled at a lot of different things, you know, because we had that exposure early on. We were the first black uh, swimming family in Southern California. So we were swimming all up and down the coast, AAU national competition, and we were the first black uh, black family, that, that and our friend Karen Peterson. So that was my dad's best friend and so we we swam together as six girls but one's name was peterson the other name was schaefer and that was my introduction into the aquatic world and also into the world of like we don't belong here you know there is there a space for us here i mean when we would go into the stadiums to swim for a swim competition a swim meet i mean you could hear a pin drop when the Schaefer mm. girl showed up. I mean, it was, you could hear a pin drop. And I Where is this? Where in uh, Southern California? Santa Monica, California. Mm. And so I was on the Santa Monica swim team, my sisters and I, and we would swim all up and down the coast and met, uh, Modesto and just, and then we did have the grand finale of the Junior Olympics that my sister qualified to make. So that was our big exodus, big family trip to Hawaii for the first time. I had lobster for the first time. I was like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm loving this life. I'm loving this life. And then I was gotten into some <laughs> pretty big, <laughs> I got into some pretty big body surfing on that trip. And mm. that was the first time I can remember being at Makapu Beach in Hawaii and just being able to see in the water so clear, you could see bodies floating up and getting ready to take the waves. And my father actually got caught in a riptide and had to be rescued by the lifeguards. So we had no this shit. big experience as young black girls going to Hawaii for a, for the lily white swim meet. And one of my <laughs> sisters was actually good enough to actually make the finals. But also we were five girls that were hitting puberty. We were five girls that were trying to grow up. We were tired of having chlorine, chlorinated hair. I had mm. cut all my sister's hairs into afros and we looked like the Jackson five. Like I cut everybody's hair and it was like we were the Jackson five all of a sudden. So we had these afros and we we're going to swim meets, but sooner or later young girls want to be young women and they don't really want to do that. And then the whole hair thing, of course, we all know about that. Um, and so I drifted out of, little by little, we drifted out of that swimming world. Then segue to myself as a young uh, adult or just uh, like a teenager, my late teens, I was sort of mindlessly wandering in the world, not really knowing what to do with myself, halfway going to college, but really majoring in drugs and alcohol anyway. So, you know, oh, <laughs> I, you're not I, lying, I, this is action packed. <laughs> that, let's be real, that was, that was my true major. You know, I don't even remember actually going to class or passing it. You know, I just was at this place where, you know, I was a young woman, my father had passed tragically, and I was just lost, you know, I just was, you know, just trying to find my way. And then one of the families that we grew up with within the swim culture, he was also a stuntman. He was a Hollywood stuntman and he was bigger than life. And he was this big, tall, handsome stuntman who used to sit me on his lap and say, you're so beautiful. You're going to be the best actress and you're going to, you know, and I just be like, really, that's all going to happen to me. So he had a gym where different stunt people would come and work out and socialize much like a lot of the groups that the people by POC are trying to form a community and a support system for each yeah. other. So the young stunt people, we had this support system. Well, when the black established stuntmen 
heard there was a new girl in town. Well, they have to come over there and check me out. And next thing I knew, I was being, you know, hand delivered to Universal Studios for my first wardrobe fitting and interview to double Debbie Allen on a movie of the week. So Debbie was- Allen's from my hometown, Houston. Whoa, well, you know, that was my first memory. And I remember getting the paycheck and thinking, I get this? for doing that, for like playing, you know? And that was the beginning of my career as a Hollywood stunt woman and actress. And so that's really how it all came to be. So as I was training for stunts, motorcycles, whatever, buying motorcycles, snowboarding, skiing, doing just all the things, you know, practicing high falls, just practicing fights, doing all the things that a stunt person could imagine doing. I was like, well, shoot, I better learn how to surf. I mean, I can swim, I can outswim anybody, I better. So I went to ET surfboards, bought myself a five nine swallowtail. I didn't have any help, any support. I learned by school of hard knocks. I took that board, yes. Did you start to surf because of like a job? Like were you finding roles where as a stunt person you could be a surfer or what? Well, that was always the hope, but as a stunt person training, your objective is to just surround yourself and become the most eclectic physical you know being that you possibly can so mm-hmm. you get you're like a jack of all trades so when i picked up surfing it was just one more thing that i wanted to be really excellent at and i figured because i had this water background that it would come easily to me and more or less it did but now i love i just it just brings me so much joy. I just love helping people. I just love getting people, you know, up and riding waves. It just, I just love it. It just makes me so happy because I didn't have that when I was learning. I literally did learn by school of hard knocks. It was fine because I was a really strong swimmer and I had an idea of what I was trying to do. But I just, I just always remember and look back like how much better, how much quicker I could have got if I had a Surfier Negra, you know, if I had a Black Dot Surfers, if I had something like that, you know, and and that's like my mission because I see people that desire this and they have this desire, but yet they have no, you know, foundation. And sometimes just a little bit of a tweak, a little bit of a tip, a little bit of a, uh, uh, and all of a sudden that person has a breakthrough and you change their life. Because now instead of them struggling in the water and really not succeeding, now they're succeeding. And for me, I love that moment. Like I can cry about it because I just love that moment. I love that moment of like, no, 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 you're fine. You're just doing, it's just you got a couple bad habits where I don't know where you picked them up, but here, let you try it this way. And then to see someone succeed and to see that joy and to see that positive exchange of energy it's just like, I just love it, you know? And so that's like my long-winded story. Sorry, y'all, I'm taking up all the time. But that <laughs> was how it happened. I used to think of surfing was no different than motocross. I'd go out and hit them trails, honey, hit them tracks and, you know, jump them bikes. And, do you know, so it was all the same because my goal was to be the bomb black stunt woman. And I was one of the first black Hollywood stunt women uh, as well. And so, you know, we had everything up against us and we had a lot of lawsuits and a lot of, you know, I have a lot of um, awards and honors for creating more or enhancing, creating more diversity in Hollywood of what we've had to go through, how we've been treated. Like stunt, the stunt world is kind of also kind of the, lowest of the low in terms of racism, sexism. Ooh, it's just off the hook. In fact, I recently got off of Facebook because I was just so inundated, you know, since the revolution started, I was so inundated with um, toxicity and racism that I just couldn't stand it. It was making me sick to my stomach. From like peers in the uh, yeah. stunt world? Peers that you have and they're friends. But they ain't your friends. Yeah. You know, you got them kind of friends. The ones that'll go vote for Trump, them kind of friends, you know? So they're people that you know, they're more like work associates, but they're not my friends. And so to read some of the painful, disgusting remarks I know that we've all seen, right, everybody? We've all seen things that make us feel like, ew, you're more worried about a looted target than our own lives? Like, 
you know, are just, are putting some, are putting the deceased down. You know, that's like, oh, making us bad, making us the victim. And yeah. so that was happening. And so the struggle within the stunt world, it's really the last place on earth where blackface is still okay. Because what they do is say to you, you're not qualified, you're not good enough to double the actor that you should be doubling, you know? So we're gonna bring in a man or a white girl somebody who is qualified and we're just gonna dismiss you never mind that you've put all your work all your training all your money you put your life on the line just like everybody else but you're not good enough when a really juicy competitive style job comes up like usually driving that's a very prestigious stunt driving is very prestigious work so they're always trying to take the wheel out of our hands and put it in a white woman's hands or a man and so these are the kind of things that I've come up with and have fought my whole entire life. My activism is just, you know, it's just all I know is just fighting to survive, fighting for the right to work, fighting for the right to be, fighting for the right to be acknowledged. And my talent and my study and my training is just as valid as yours. So that's really, sorry, it's such a long-winded answer, everybody, but um, that's how I came into the surfing world and then when I had my big moment where I was kind of discovered in Puerto Escondido, Mexico, otherwise known as the Mexican Pipeline, um, <laughs> when that happened then it just blew up. All of a sudden mm. I, had full, I was fully sponsored, I was fully endorsed and I was traveling around and doing surf meets and you know I was doing photo shoots for wetsuit companies and just whatever. It just, it just happened very fast. It happened very that's, late that's in life. That's so interesting to like see that, to like see you want come from an industry here and jump right into another one fully as you're kind of learning the ropes. You know, something interesting about all of y'all is it seems like you all had different approaches to surfing. You know, mm -hmm. there wasn't that like conventional way where I've been surfing since I was a little kid, basically, right. even though you, you had a lot of interactions with the water. Mm -hmm. But it seems like now each of you in a way are pushing for more people to have the chances to start early. And I hear that there's this common thread of helping people between all of y'all. And I'm just curious, when was the moment when you felt like it was important to go out there and inspire people? Mary? Well, you know what, first, can I hear Gigi's story? Because I don't know how she started. Yeah. I mean, I can't go follow Sharon, man. Um, so actually, <laughs> mine is pretty simple. I, I uh, actually, I had a, a completely different life before surfing. I um, worked in fashion in New York City for about 15 years doing international markets and retail expansion and was a complete type A ball buster. But um where I grew up, I was born in Tampa, Florida, grew up, my parents actually raised catamarans. And so Sharon, kind of like you, we were like the black family at the regattas. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, the one thing that I learned from my childhood was that like, you have to get comfortable being the only one sometimes, like that can't stop you from doing what piques your interest. And so um, fast forward back to corporate, I advanced got tired of sitting at board meetings with all white men telling me like, I didn't know, I was like, always challenging me. And I decided to break away, start my own consulting business. And then that in turn gave me freedom to live anywhere. And mm -hmm. um, I had always back at, I think I might've been like 34 or something like that. I had always wanted to learn how to surf before I turned 40, just as a leisure hobby. And decided to leave New York, move to Costa Rica, pretty much center my life around surfing, swells, tides, learning the ocean. And that's how it was. So that's kind of how I came to surfing. And I was 35 when I started surfing. Wow. Wow. That's like me when I hit the pro circuit. I was old. I was old. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like, I, I mean, 41 now, and I feel like I'm just starting. Like, I feel like it's wow. a rebirth. And I think that's, Tony, to answer your question, though, I think that's why, that's when I, well, part of the reason why I knew that no, more people like me need to see this. Yeah. Like more people like me need to know about this because had I known about surfing when I was like 13, 14, formative years where I'm making decisions about who I am as a woman, man, I would have made some different decisions because I felt like so many, looking back, I felt so many influences that were outside of my culture, even outside of who I am intrinsically, 
were driving me to do what I was doing, i.e. go the corporate route, try to make everybody else comfortable. Yeah. But had I had the confidence that surfing gives me, man. Yeah, I hear you. Well, I hear you. Even though the stories are so different, um, there's a similar tone to them of what we were experiencing in our prior lives. And I'm still in that that entertainment world, kind of. If COVID kills everything, doesn't kill it altogether. I mean, I think Hollywood's dead, but uh, hey, I don't know. <laughs> but it, it, there's a similar thread of, of how we've experienced the life in the workplace, whatever the workplace was, and how surfing like sets us free and gives us a new vision and a new goal. And so when I kind of took took off, took a break from Hollywood and did my surf thing, it was so freeing just to say, bye, I'll see you guys later, maybe. You know, like I just was not concerned with it at all. And then there was a lot of frustration about that, that, well, she's not even here to accept the work, you know, but mm. I was just doing my thing, you know, so, um, but anyway, thank you for that story, Gigi, because it really, even though they're completely different, it sounds the same to me. It feels yeah, the same. Yeah, same to me. It feels the same, yeah. Same to me too, you know, and I'm and I'm speaking as a person that is not a surfer, that has never had any interest in surfing or oh. any knowledge about <laughs> it. So, so to hear y'all stories, I was just getting ready to say, <laughs> we gotta get you out there, that Tony. Done. <laughs> what? Well, first things first, I gotta start swimming. That's the that's my first step. <laughs> oh, that Tony. <laughs> that, is so, that, is so that is so very real though because um with my girls that's, that was i quickly learned that was the biggest barrier to entry is swimming and there is so many misconceptions about not only swimming in a pool but swimming in an ocean no mm -hmm. less it's a very different environment and it's primarily because like our culture not all cultures because sharon i mean you're a prime example not not all of us go through that that disconnection part or that um, planting of a seed of fear from their parents with the ocean. Mm. But I can definitely say well, a lot of girls, that's the first thing. Not, I have two questions. One, I don't know how to swim. And then two, what about my hair? Mm. <laughs> I've, I've heard y'all yeah. mention the hair and I've heard Texture Waves mention it. How, what is the process of approaching swimming and, and then wondering what it's gonna do to your hair? Who wants, who wants this one? <laughs> no. Mary, tell me about it. We black women put way too much weight on the importance of our hair. It's just hair. But we've been acculturated to think it has to be straight and it has to be long or it has to, you know, it has to look like white people's hair. Right. And like share, like, everyone here i've always been very in touch with my blackness so once i realized my hair was holding me back i just cut it all off i've been natural ever since i had an afro for years and now i have dreadlocks i will never straighten my hair again because your whole life mm. revolves around keeping your hair straight or quote unquote presentable i love my hair white people love my hair the only people who kind of look askance at my hair is black people, truthfully. It, it's so it's so incredibly true, you know, that we're all, the only thing I would uh, challenge you, Mary, on that is I don't think we do it to ourselves. I think it's done to us. The minute we pop out of the womb, it starts done to, it's being done to us immediately. Mm -hmm. And I can even see other people's children. I don't have children, but I mean, I have a sister and the minute the baby's popped out, she says, oh, I didn't want them to have noses like that. And, you know, it's like, wow, like, for real? Did you just say that? You know, and so it's so in us, this this coming from slavery, this self-hatred thing, it, it, it's just so in us that we have to go through the journey to where Mary gets to the point where she just cuts it all off and says, let's just do the damn thing natural. And, and same with me, I had the straight hair and the Halle Berry spikes and the whole thing and da da da. And you know, one day through, I don't know when, I can't even remember it now to be honest, but I think I had some kind of dreadies for a while. They were kind of permed, but they were still kind of dreadies. And that was my transition of just not using permanent 
chemicals in my hair, not even coloring my hair. Um, you know, I have some autoimmune issues. So that stuff's really bad for you anyway, that chemicalizing of the body, chemicalizing of the hair, of the skin with perfumes and colognes, it's all poison. And so it's like once you kind of really learn that all of this that we go through to try to be acceptably beautiful is all a bunch of poison crap anyway. It's like, okay, like, let's just give it to them and let them kill themselves. You know what I mean? It's like, it, it's like the crack epidemic almost. You know, black women perming their hair and putting that chemical on their scalp that seeps into your skin and into your brain. And then we wonder why we have some issues later on in life, you know, from some of the stuff that we've subjected our bodies to. So it's a really big thing. Like when I cut all my hair off, like bzz, buzz, bald. Dude, if I'd have known the men were going to be you know, coming at me, trying to touch my head, and they liked it. I would have cut that stuff off years ago. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I mean, my main thing, my main thing, my main person I was trying to please is boys. I wanted yeah. guys to like me. So if they wanted straight hair or whatever, they were going to get it. And so that was my motivation. It wasn't so much that I felt I needed it to be beautiful, but I felt like in order to get a significant other, I needed to have the traits that he would want. And, but I found out when I did cut it all off that that wasn't true. And I still go through it a little bit. I still go through, like if I'm in the water, <laughs> something funny, not funny happened to me a couple weeks ago. Should I tell? Yeah, of Quick course. Quick little story. Of course. Just having to do in this, this cycle. I sent Kelly Slater a picture of me surfing because we've been talking back and forth, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's just me, no makeup, no blush, no little lip gloss, and just your hair in its full nappiness, not with my little curls I got in now, you know, my little product and get it cute. Just, you know, just hair, just naps and hair and short. And I look like a boy anyway. So anyway, so Kelly responds to the, <laughs> to the picture as if he thought it was a dude. He goes, oh, yeah, he, da, 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 he really looks like he loves surfing. And I was like, Kelly, that's me. <laughs> that is me. You know, wait, Sharon, can I just say something? Oh, really my crazy? goodness. I'm more confused. <laughs> oh, my God. Sharon. <laughs> yes. There's a similar story. So that I did a, con a little friendly surf competition maybe uh, two years ago. And the photographer caught, like, a little peeler. I was, like, grabbing the rail into the wave. I actually have a big fall cap. And I remember paddling out and this guy, I was talking to this guy in the lineup and he was like, yeah, you know, I saw pictures. And he was like, there was this guy who had the biggest smile on her, on his face. And, and I was like, wait, they have a black cap? I was like, yo, that was me. Like, what are you doing? And he, but, but here's the thing, because in their minds, in people's minds, there's a certain image they have about what a female surfer looks like or yes. what a woman yes. would look like. And we weren't it. We weren't it until we're here now. Mm -hmm. But now, like, I feel like, especially with, you know, platforms like Instagram, Texture Waves and, and the like, people are starting to get more acclimated in, ter in terms of what a woman looks like, mm -hmm. right? Because we are women. We are women. And we're here. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I feel you. It hurt. It stung a little bit. But then I was like, you know what? It's okay. It's okay. I mean, it's funny because we keep selling the same story to completely different circumstances, but the same story, literally the same path, the same journey, the same mm -hmm. emotions that come with that. Like it didn't bother me at all because I'm so used to it. Like I said, we used to look like the Jackson 5. I'm used to being mistaken for a boy my whole life. Yo, last time I got pulled over, I was like, please don't shoot me because I know at first glance, I could definitely be, I did, I did. I said, please don't shoot me, yo. You know, like, hey. And he goes, well, why did you, why do you say that? And I look at him like, why do you think I say that? Why, you know, like, why would you, I wonder why I would say such a thing. But I just feel like uh, I've been mistaken for a boy my whole life. So it was nothing new when Kelly did it. It just actually was an opportunity for fodder and fun. And you same know, old I, shit, I, you know. I, same old shit, but it, 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 it kind kind of propelled our discussion forward, if that makes sense, you know? Um, so it is what it is, but like I say, what I, what I end up saying to him in the last 
part of discussing that. I said, well, you know, I, I, I wasn't looking my Sunday best. You know, my salt sea water hair wasn't my best look and I didn't have my, my little lip gloss on. And, you know, so, yeah, but that was Kept me, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, man, it is so what, what it was is. this when, when y'all are first like approaching the industry side of surfing, right? what was the response to y'all's image you know you you mentioned earlier that there's this image of a female surfer that many people have in their mind as you are getting your foot in the door as far as the industry goes what type of response were were you getting were you getting questions about your hair were you getting questions about what you're doing there etc i can always talk ladies yeah. i'm talking <laughs> talk. remember you know you know i got a big mouth what can i say <laughs> I'll talk after Sharon because I, I feel like I, I probably have some different perspectives. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't even know uh, if I remember the question anymore, but well, I'll go first. <laughs> yeah. So in terms of the surf industry, I've stayed away from it because I'm not their demographic. I'm a middle-aged black woman. Surfing doesn't care about me, the surf industry. They care about white guys who are 18 to 34, or they care about white chicks who look good in bikinis and little tight wetsuits that don't cover anything. Right. So in my mind, I'm going to do it my way. And that's why I don't wear off the rack wetsuits. I wear custom wetsuits that are green, red, light blue, because I'm my own industry. I don't need mm. the surf industry. I heard that. So, that's my that's my attitude. That girl, ooh, I'm gonna steal that one from you. I might have to put that in a speech or something yes. soon. I'm my own industry. <laughs> Woo! Well, I I can really relate to what Mary just said. I mean, as far as the industry, you know, the way I was treated when I was there, it was very good. I can't say that I experienced racism in the moment. I don't feel that I did. I feel like I saw and recognize racism because the the truth is is i was not delivering the kind of results that were going to get a lot of spotlight on me i was there but like i say i had learned by school of hard knocks so i didn't even understand what to do in a heat but here i am at a wqs event i don't even know what what i'm supposed to do to make the way like i learned literally by doing and by the time i learned it it was over you know that that opportunity so the surf industry just they they said hi nice to see you come on in when you're here but they didn't do anything to support me to engage me to give me any kind of longevity uh black people that were in the industry did not do anything to support me or engage me um there's been documentaries made that i have been inexplicably um left out of very painful extremely painful for me because it's my it's my own people now doing it i can't say what they did but i can say what i can talk about black on black crime i can talk about that that's a real problem even now as i sit that that there's just so much infighting and in black on black crime and just you know like it's like you're talking about there is that within surfing yeah, within the industry I, I do I, I do find that i mean mary you know you kind of have some experience with what i'm talking about with black surfing association and black surf collective it's like it's like there's always some problem why people can't get along and it's very demoralizing for me because i'm just i'm a lover not a fighter you know what i mean like i don't yeah. have that in me i don't like so i don't know how to rumble even though i know how to punch do a picture fight and do a stop do a kick-ass uh stunt fight in my person as an individual as a human it's just not my style to be like that and i find that i keep encountering it all the time just this infighting and basically what I've coined a black on black crime, you know, like we're our own worst enemies, it seems like. And that is very painful um, for me to have been a part of and to see it still going on. And so, I mean, the industry itself, I just know that for it, if I was a white woman and had done what I had done, I would have accumulated more longevity. 
mm. in my path. And here I am now in 2020 because this revolution is coming and all of a sudden they're looking at us again and they want to take pretty pictures of us and they want to practice the tokenism that they love to practice so much, you know, <laughs> but we don't get a seat at the table, right? So, you know, now we're back again. So now I feel like because of the revolution, like pre-revolution, just COVID, I was like, well, God, why do I have to stay on this toxic planet that I'm allergic to? Like, I don't get it. Why do, why do I have to be here? And then when the revolution started, it was like, oh, that's why you're here. And so for me, it's been the most invigorating, most beautiful time of my life, but it's also been the most painful. And I think that probably we could all agree on that. The pain that we have encountered. Oh, yeah. We're like walking open wounds now, you know? All the stuff that you kind of put away and you tried to heal it, and if it wasn't quite healed, you still tucked it away. It just wasn't out on your skin bleeding every day. Now it's like we're walking around, you know, wounded birds, just, just open wounds. I think people of color are right now. And we got been throwing some election stress on top of it. It's like, oh my goodness. But now I can see my purpose now. I can see the mountaintop now. You know, I can feel why I'm supposed to be here to lift up a people of color in aqu in the aquatic world. And now I get it. Uh, Pre-revolution, I did not understand why I needed to be here. <laughs> I really didn't. I was like, what in the hell? You know, because. Yeah, so. I feel like all of us have been given the time to really sit with ourselves and think about our purpose and our origins and how we'd like our tomorrow to really be in all aspects of our life yeah. So yeah i think we're all here with you we're all here and 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 now like i say moments like this i was so excited i was so ha happy to see my old friend mary and my new friend Gigi. it just was like oh you know because it just makes me happy because I just like to see the women that are doing it and not and leaving all that other behind that, that stuff that doesn't serve us. It's just there's too many black folks out there participating in behaviors that do not serve us as a whole. And it's very demoralizing, you know, for me to see as far as them, as far as the surf business. Well, um, I'm knocking on their door pretty hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I'm a knock, knock, knocking, and I don't think they can ignore me. So I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing, and you know, we'll see as things unfold. Um, I can't really speak publicly about too much of it, just because it's all like you know brewing, and you know how it is. It's so so a little sensitive. If something happens, you know, it could explode in your face. But I'm really trying to make a difference in terms of diversity in surfing in the business of surfing i'm trying to be like the face of diversity you know like a real place that in within professional surfing like if a bi poc person has an issue or a woman has an issue that there should be some platform some forum where they can come and you know air their grievances and feel safe because right now there is no safe place you hear a story two years later about somebody feeling like they're bullied in the water instead of in real time they don't there's nobody to there's nobody accountable to that like you say the demographic what do you say mary is 18 to 34. that's mm -hmm. all they seem to care about is what you know white dudes 18 to 34 are thinking and the rest of us just don't seem to matter you know um so i'm really doing what i can to change that i'm i'm just really thinking like it's like i see i have a vision and i'm just trying to stay on course and, 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 and just try to have a real seat at the table and a real face of diversity because I have this parallel world, you know, I have these parallel worlds that like entertainment surfing, entertainment surfing, but they're so similar in terms of what I'd experienced. And, you know, within the stunt world, it's like, I'm so used to them saying, no, 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 not you. No, no, you're too black. Oh, now you're too old. Now, now I'm dealing with that ageism on top of the uh, racism and sexism. Now I'm all broad too, on top of it, you know what I mean? So, you know, you just get that all the time. You're just so used to it. And all I know to do is just keep on, keep on forging forward. Just keep on forging forward. And that's, that's all I know how to do. And when I find myself surrounded by toxicity, I just need to excuse myself very quickly and yeah. just keep it going. 
Yeah. You know, keep it, keep it moving. And, you know, I think even as of today, there is some kind of toxicity that went down last night. And, um, you know, even as to today, I think that I'm no longer going to align myself with one particular group. I feel like I belong to all the groups. Whoever wants me can have me. They can just reach out and I'm there for you. But I'm going to stop trying to align myself with one particular group because every time I do, there seems to be some problem. Like they don't want me. They want me, but they don't want me. You know, and like I say, it's very demoralizing and very like, because I just love to help. Just getting back to the simple, the simplicity of it. I just love to help. I'll help white dudes in the water. I don't care. Like if I see someone struggling in the water, I'm going to help them. And that's just who I am. And that's just what I do. You know, we had a, a 12 mile paddle, uh, David Milano, Color the Water, did a 12 mile paddle from Inkwell Beach to, do you know the story of um, Nick Gob- not Gobbledon and all that? Okay, yeah, oh, so yeah. He, did a, he did a mock 12 mile paddle and it was really ceremonious and really solemn and then it was really fun too, just a lot of laughing and good times and, you know, it was really my cup of tea. But now a few days afterwards, there's this toxicity brewing, it, brewing in the air and it's just like, oh God, here we go again. And so I just think from this point forward, I belong, you know, Gigi, you want me to do something for you? You, you call me and I'll do it. You know, Mary, you need something from me? I will do it. It's like, I just want to give my heart and my goodness and my expertise um, to those who want it and want to embrace it and want to appreciate it. And like, I'm just so tired of the other. <laughs> I'm just so depleted and tired of the other. Um, so that's how I feel about the surf industry. I remember Tita Tavares. Does anybody remember that name? Tita Tavares? Tita Tavares was a Brazilian, is a Brazilian, not was. She's still, she's alive. Brazilian world champion. And so when I was fooling around, not getting results, not even getting out of the heat, Tita was out there doing it. So I remember racism, not necessarily towards me, but I can definitely remember towards this little brown girl. Mm. She had to, she had to surf three times as good as the other girls to get the score that she deserved. So when she won, she really won. She like triple won. And I remember watching her downscored, underscored. And I remember thinking, you know, I'm just dopey. I don't know what I'm doing either. But I remember thinking, that sucks. You know, it's, um, it's objective or subjective, I guess is the word you know, scoring, like in gymnastics or whatever, but still, it just didn't make sense. I could see it with my own eyes. I could see the racism playing out in my own eyes, that this girl could not get the scores that she that she deserved. And so that's my only experience with actually seeing it in the business when I was fully in the business. I didn't see it towards me because, like I say, I wasn't, I wasn't getting those scores. So, mm. you know, that that's really what I remember, but that's just... I don't know, especially right now today, I just, I just feel like I just want to open m- up my heart and whatever good I have in me to all by POC people and, and not necessarily align myself with any one particular uh, group anymore. Hmm. And so that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm at. But I feel like there's, the, you know, on the flip side, I feel like there's a lot of hope. I feel like, you know, with every revolution, with every protest, with, you know, there's hope. And, and, and so I get, I'm, I'm sort of, I don't know how the rest of you are feeling, but I'm sort of interspersed with hope and then despair and then hope and then some more despair. And I guess that's just part of the price of the time that we're living in. Tugging you back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. And I know we must all feel it in our perspective um, situations or environments yeah. like, ah, oh, they're trying to push you down, but nope, you got to keep going, you know? You got to keep going. So that's where I'm at. Gigi, what was your experience like? Um, it, I, I'm so glad that I'm going last because it's really interesting to hear both Mary's and Sharon's perspective and their experience because when I actually first, because I have, I mean, I have a straight business background. I mean, working with Fortune 500 companies, growing business, bottom line growth, doing market research, understanding like all of that part. When I first came to the surf industry, I actually came from that perspective, not necessarily to be a face of anything, but like, hey, I'm consulting. I have this experience. I've also, I've actually done research according to the Nielsen report that my demographic, our demographic has 
triple the amount of disposable income, you might want to think about marketing to us. Let me help you do it. Radio silence, radio silence. Mm. But now fast forward, Black Lives Matters, we're hot in the streets. It's the trendy thing to do is put our face on an ad. Then yeah, yeah. of course they want to talk to us. But as Mary said, you know, and both Sharon said, it's interesting to see if organizations in the surf industry actually really give us a seat at the table. Because it's one thing to have a facade and to market and to grab the dollar, but to really invest and bring us into the, into the, surf, into the industry is a very different thing. And so I think at the end of the day, what I kind of agree with Mary about is we, if we stop the infighting, we can be our own industry. We can be our own, you know, capsule within the industry and take a tremendous amount of market share because we have dollars. And if we want to protest in that way, we can protest with our dollars very easily, but it's just a matter of organizing accordingly. So um, I was, it was, it's been an interesting ride, like to say the very least. Um, I think having Surfia Negra has allowed me to invest my talent skills experience into something that I know is going to push our culture forward in a very sustainable way. Um, but it is interesting seeing the trajectory of how black people and people of color are being interspersed within the industry. I don't, mm -hmm. at this point, I'm not hundred percent sold that, you know, it's genuine. We'll see, <laughs> we'll see. But um, I think it's more than just putting our face on a, a pretty picture. I can say that. It's so true. So, 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 so true. It's like, we, we, you know, the doors, they're kind of cracking it a little, but then they run and hide real quick when you get close to the door, you know? It's like, oh, no, 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 no. So it's just, it's just very interesting what, what we're all kind of saying. And, and I think, you know, your background, Gigi, is what makes me um, envious because of all the stuff I've done, I don't have that. And that's what I sorely lack, right? No, no, because you need that business. You need, honey, I'm struggling on Instagram, y'all. <laughs> I'm struggling, <laughs> y'all. You know, it's not, it's not that easy to just all of a sudden learn this stuff if that's not your life. My life has been very performance-based. I'm the, in front of the camera girl. I don't know anything about all that stuff you just rattled but, off. Sharon, you know? here's the thing, and this is where I feel like if we could come together, as a culture and as a people, this is why we need each other because everybody's not gonna be able to do everything. Like one person has a certain talent, the other person has a certain talent and we need to pull that together to create the, the greater good, right? Like you tell me to get on a motocross bike, I'm like, hell no, but, <laughs> but this is why, yeah, this is why. I, and the other thing I'll say to this part in terms of the infighting, we as the black culture, black community within surfing have to put down the mentality of being the only one. Oh, yeah. All of us can eat. There's yeah. plenty of room for all of us. Totally. And I do think that that tokenism mentality of, no, I need to be the face of insert whatever company into the line. We have to put that down. Right? Yeah. Because there's plenty of room and there's plenty of blue sky that hasn't been created yet. That's true. Well, well that is agree. a very optimistic and wonderfully wonder wonderful kind of a, a goal to reach and sort of you know wrap our arms around because it's so hard to get there you know it's so hard to to get to that place but you're so right then that's what that's why i always am dumbfounded when, whenever i encounter toxicity within the bi plc community i'm always dumbfounded it's like what really what? like i don't i don't even I don't even understand what you're talking about. Like, I'm so blindsided by it usually. You know, I don't even understand what the offenses are. What is it people are so upset about? And, you know, but I think the more people that have the attitude that Gigi has, which is kind of new and full of birth and full of newness and full of oneness, then, and then we, can, we can get there and we will. Um, but I, but I fear there's always going to be that toxicity that kind of drags us down. But even though it's dragging us down, it's not a whole anchor that's going to keep us down. It's just something that we have to keep overcoming within ourselves. We have to keep jumping over that hump. We have to keep overcoming that situation. For me, I know that the minute I start to feel a certain way, 
like certain boundaries are crossed for me, then I know I need to step back. And that's it. And I just have to keep on I'm doing that, keep on taking care of myself first so I can, in fact, help others. You know, I can be that person f- for, you know, that people can come to, you know, but I can't do it if I'm always ducking because I'm like, whoa, where's that blow coming from? Oh, OK, sorry. <laughs> My bad. I don't even know what I did, but OK, you know, like that. There's a lot of that going on, like all summer long, you know, that's like that's my story for the summer is that's what's been going on. And so do you feel like that is coming because a lot of people within surfing want to be that sole voice as these companies are trying to add more black lives matter type of content to their programming. Do you feel like when, you know, somebody's given press or given a platform that you start to see them change? I don't, I think, Hmm. I, I don't know or is because in my, in my time. I think it's been there the whole time, but in my heart of hearts, I can honestly say that like if Gigi just got a cover on Surfer, right? Well it wasn't cover. It wasn't a cover. It oh. was a cover. <laughs> well, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> for for me, I'm only happy for you. I can say there is not one percent, not even a half percent of jealousy or envy in that. But I can't say that that's how other people view me. I think there is some jealousy. I think there is some envy. And I don't know what to do with that. I don't know how to hold those things. I don't know what to, how to process it because it's not my problem, essentially. Like, so I've experienced that where people, if there's poly people that aren't happy mm-hmm. for you that you got that. You know what yeah. I mean? And that's what I mean. That's what I mean. Like, you know, so I... I yeah. I don't know what the answer is on that one, Tony. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just here to try to learn and, and keep it moving forward, but I don't really specifically know the answer to that last question because I'm just trying to struggle and figure it out myself. But I think that's a prime example of what Gigi's talking about, that there's enough blue sky we can all create together. But every time I line up and try to create with someone, it just goes south fast. Like, it doesn't take long either. <laughs> it does not take long. So... Like I say, you know, then you kind of have to look and, you know, protect your own soul and heart first, because then you're no good to anyone if you're no good to yourself. And I think it's so, important as we're trying to inspire people to take up surfing or just, just to think outside the box, period. I think it's important to let people know that it's okay to approach this as a hobby too, because I think too often when you're trying to bring people to something, you're you we've we've been kind of taught that that we must be the best at everything that mm-hmm. we have to outperform everyone else and i think that can make certain sports especially difficult mm-hmm. for a person who feels like oh well maybe i don't belong maybe i'm too old or i'm too young or i live in the wrong place there's already barriers to it adding that extra one of, oh, if you do join up in this, you need to go to a level where you're gonna compete or you're trying to be a professional in some regard, rather than just pushing them like, hey, this can be a fun thing that you do all the time or sometimes or every now and then. I think that's really important. Well, I think that's really important. And I don't don't know that too much of that is going on, thankfully. I I think most of the organizations that I seem to have uh, some sort of, a connection to or involvement with or exposure to are just trying to get people in the water and see the tremendous blessing. It's extremely spiritual for me. And I'm sure everyone else here, you know, like the blessing is mother ocean. The blessing is being one with nature. The blessing is, is once you get a wave, you've been baptized and you're not the same anymore. And that's the blessing that we're all after. That's what we're chasing. And so um, I don't think there's any, real big pressure for people to feel like they can be pros. But I think there's this pressure of ownership and who does what and who does what with who. And I think that's, it's more of a social pressure that I'm seeing within the BIPOC community. It's not so much everyone's trying to go pro. I just see this, I don't know, like segregating ourselves almost, you know? Let's talk some truth for a second. Among us, as in any other group, you have opportunists, you have posers, Mm -hmm. you have people who say they represent one thing 
but they really represent themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's where the problem is, is we have that just like the white surf community does. And we have to be careful and keep our eyes out for who those people are. Mary, it is, you have coined what I've been kind of rambling on, trying to kind of find my way to express, and you've just beautifully said it in one or two sentences. It's so true that people have different agendas. And all I know is I can speak to my own agenda. I know, and my, I know I'm true. I know that what I want to do is get you up on a wave. Right. And I don't care what you look like and who you are. Like, I, I know that I have a gift. I know that I'm able to do that. I know that I'm able to get someone to succeed when maybe someone else can't get them to succeed. So the, the pressure and the excitement to share that gift, it just lives in me. And, but like I say, I've just literally, literally gone through um, something just in the past of 48 hours of just what I am bringing to you, which I feel like I'm bringing you my very best. I can't get, I can't gift you any better than this. This is it. So if, if this isn't good enough for you, if this isn't what you want, if this isn't what you're feeling and you don't, you find some, you don't like my teaching style. Well then, then I guess it's just not going to work out between us because my teaching style is not going to change. Cause guess what? I'm really good at it. I'm successful at it. It, it is effective. It works <laughs> the way people are drawn to me and they're coming to me and they're coming to me because I'm helping them and it's working. And so if someone doesn't like that or doesn't appreciate that, Again, I don't know what to do with that emotion. I don't know what to do with that. And I know that I'm not, I just don't have a heavy enough dose of bitch in me. I just don't. I'm just like, call me, I'll help you. Ah! <laughs> up with that. Seriously. No, but you know, but it's true. You know, as we, look, as we look at our own personalities and we look and we reflect and we know who we are, you know, I am. I'm not going to say how old I am, but I've been around. You know what I mean? And it's like, you know yourself, you know what you're, you know what you can sustain and what you can hold and you know what you can't. Yeah. And some of the people that you're just talking about, Mary, I can't, I can't because we're just on different, like almost universes or something. Well, Cause what they want and what I want just seem to be clashing. And some of these people can't serve. I want to no. use you to make them look good. And yeah. guess what? You don't need to do that because it's under the guise of helping black people. But some of these people don't help black people. They help themselves mm. and you're not going to help them with that. So mm. it's time to walk away. Well, thank you again. I'm a little bit close to tears. That's very, very beautiful what you just said. And I really appreciate it because um, I'm going to be honest with you, everybody. I have been going through it with, with, with some people. And um, yeah, and they're talking. I didn't. I didn't get a good night's sleep last night because of what we're talking about. And it's just wow. you know, I'm just truthful. I don't know who you're talking about, but I know who you're talking about. <laughs> so mm -mm, it's time to cut that. Actually, you don't. It's some. Um, it's uh, it, it, there's more than one. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I think I feel like for uh, the rest of the year and the, the rest of our lifetime, we should definitely not allow the type of bullshit that we've allowed in the past because we want to keep the peace or, mm. or we think that maybe it'll be for the benefit of some good down the line, whether that's working together or just being nice. You got to really protect yourself because uh, shit is hard. It's only getting harder, but things can be better if you're smart about it and really love yourself and and protect yourself. You know, it's it's fun. There's like an old Liberian uh, phrase that says, if it doesn't need to be fed, don't feed it. And I mean, in my background, like I've run into so many wolves and sheep clothing, um, so many people who voice like, lip service said one thing, but as Mary said, had diff very different agendas that serve self. And um, one of the things that I realized wholeheartedly is one, trust your gut. That's the first thing, trust your gut, because you know innately what that person is about. Don't invest in writing their wrongs because <laughs> it's just never gonna work. And then you're gonna expend yourself literally 
playing into the charades, playing into the circus, but instead focus on what you're offering and purposes and like go hard. There are going to be so many people. And I, and you're right, Sharon, like not everybody's happy for me. I get it. I know that that's the game, but at the same time, I know what my purpose and my offering is. And that's where I have to Mm. stay. I can't ask for people's Mm -hmm. permission. I can't walk around trying to please everybody. I just have to stay in my mission and in my purpose and everything else doesn't concern me to be honest with you. I think you do it. Yeah. I think you I think this podcast today with being with you beautiful women and you beautiful man that we got to get on a surfboard. Yes. Cuz you just you just, you just I'm sorry but you got the look. You got the look of someone I want to snatch and put in a wetsuit and get you really do that's me. That's me you guys. That means you play you should be surfing. You should be surfing yo. I'm telling you. But you know, I'm so This I'm, might be it. <laughs> this might be it. This might be my hey, beginning. Three of us can't get you. Like where are you at? I'm in Tucson, in Arizona. You're in Tucson, Arizona. No, ocean. there's a lot of surf in there. <laughs> <laughs> Got to come to uh, California for that. Yeah. Well, I just it it this feels like such a blessing and kind of a renewal, and um, you know I'm just so pleased that we're talking about these topics that really do affect us. They really do affect us on the daily, on the day to day. It really affects you and. Like I say, I had a huge epiphany last night into today, well into today. It just, you know, it disturbed my sleep and everything. And I wasn't necessarily up for this. But then I thought, well, but this is God's way. This is the light. Just get yourself to that screen, that Zoom screen at five o'clock and then watch the beauty unfold and watch the blessings unfold. So even though I didn't really feel like I was up for it, I kind of got up for it. And because I knew that I wanted this so badly, this community, because I just, I just, um, I crave it. I really mm-hmm. crave it. I, I love it. And, and, and like I say, it's just recognizing my gifts of what I can do and what I can't do. You know, a lot of the technological or, you know, all that business background that a lot of people have, I'm just, Ooh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that. But when you have comes, your own gifts, you know. Yeah, I have my own gifts. And, and and the ones that I do have, though, they really work good. Yeah. <laughs> they really work well, you know. So it's like, shoot, it just, it just kind of gives me a breath of fresh air today because I'm yet again leaving another organization behind. Not leaving them. But they can always call me, but I'm not, I'm not going to be involved with them the way I thought I was going to be. And you know, keep it moving, man. Yeah, just keep it moving. Just keep it moving. And and like I say, I feel like I'm there for everyone. If if they want me, then I'm I'm there for you. And that's that's my message, you know. And and you know, yeah. I tell surf friends, regardless of race, don't let other people steal your joy. Mm -hmm. Because surfing is joyful. And if somebody takes that from you. You should be ready to fight. Don't give it away. Ooh. Don't let them steal it. That's yeah. your joy. And if they want to take it, I don't know. Buckle up. <laughs> Church. Well, you know, that's why I'm at. It might take me a day or two to realize it because the wolves, they do come in sheep's clothing. They yeah. can come in the most serene, but most yin, most calm voice. Now, me, I'm very animated. I'm a dopey actor. I mean, I'm, ah, I'm just, you know, I've got a lot going on within my person that comes out. I'm not always, you know, so I've just had it with a person that you would never expect it from. Mm. You would never think that this was him. Mm, Yet it was him. Yeah, that's what he was. That he, you know. Can we guess who it is? <laughs> well, we're not going to name names. <laughs> well, I wouldn't mind a guess, but I won't name names either. But uh, <laughs> I'm wondering what who who you think it is. <laughs> we'll talk later. Yeah, we'll talk later. <laughs> yeah, um, I appreciate Who's y'all coming on pot? today, Who's man. trying to stir that pot? Get that pot going. Well, I don't know. It it it, it it's sad, but I think Mary and Gigi, you know, I'm listening to their words are moments well spent Mm. because I do get tangled up in that. I think because of my status of who, who I am to to black surfing, you know, I do get easily tangled into these situations, you know, like they want you, but they don't want you. 
Yeah. That's what I'm kind of feeling like. They want you because you're Sharon Schaefer and whatever the hell that means. Well, but Sharon, they don't really want you. you Sharon, know? here you are wanted. Yeah. All y'all are wanted. I want to thank y'all for coming to True Conversation. It's been great talking to y'all. A lot of joy <laughs> tonight, man. Appreciate it for real. <laughs> I feel like these, you know, these could go on forever. <laughs> you know, we could just keep talking like friends, talking over a long, long dinner with dessert yeah. and after drinks and the whole thing. I feel like, you know, this could just, I feel like this is just the beginning uh, of this combo. Can I, can I just say one thing really quickly before we sign off? Um, <laughs> I'm so glad we're having this conversation about community and, and mm. reviving community because one thing I do know as kind of like touching, touching bases with the next generation they're going to need aunties. They're going to need women who look like them, who've been in the game, who can give them the sage advice as to not let anyone or anything steal their joy, to be a soul surfer, to be a competitive surfer, to be a stunt woman. Like all of the things that we're talking about here, they need that. And we can't let ego in this day and age, in our generation, erode that. We cannot. Like we, it's our time. We're the, we're the gatekeepers and we have to pay it forward. Agreed. That's so real. Shay, that's real. That's real. Um, Much love wow. to y'all, man. Hey, thank well, you, Tony. Yeah. Can I just say, um, <laughs> if anyone's looking for us, should we tell our Instagram? Oh, handle? yes, Whatever. absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, Run it up. I, I Where feel can like we people would be on me if I didn't say it. <laughs> They'd be like, you, you didn't mention that. <laughs> so I can be found for my adventures in surfing, poetry, and music on Instagram at Iamanja. Mm a.k.a. Sharon Schaefer. Iemanja was a is the Brazilian singing goddess of the sea. How do you spell I, that? I-E-M-A-N-J-A with an accent on the A. Iemanja. Okay. And so she's a goddess that they have uh, rituals and ceremonies and a holiday and everything in Brazil. And someone gave me that name and it was just such a tender, delightful gift. And I just took it with all my heart because you know you know i'm trying to do sing my little songs and whatnot you know i be trying to sing and you know <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> and uh and write my poetry that's what's really you know really real for me is is expressing myself uh poetically and Love so it. yeah at iamanja aka sharon schaefer you can find me and so yeah gg what about you oh um Cercanegra.com is S-U-R-F-E-A-R-N-E-G-R-A.com. That's the organization. Um, same thing with the Instagram handle at Cercanegra. And for me personally, um, it's living underscore in the light on Instagram. So mm. nothing like Iamanja, but. Um, <laughs> are you kidding? So you cool. are Iamanja. <laughs> All y'all are. <laughs> Mary, where do we find you? You don't have to. Right. 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 She's, like, she's, like, she's like a bat signal. That's all you need for her. People just cry. I, so it's I, fun. I like that. I envy people like Mary so much who just say, you don't need to find me. You know? Another friend of ours, Andrea Kabwasa, which is a, she's a world-class longboarder. She's not on any social media. She's not connected into any of this. Yeah. And I'm secretly so jealous of her what for that. Freedom. <laughs> freedom. Because <laughs> she just doesn't care, I guess. Can, I mean, I haven't talked to her or seen her in that forever, but uh, that's the word, you know. Word. Yeah, she doesn't, she doesn't care. care. I feel like I have to care because if, you know, like, Gigi, we're trying to make things happen. We're trying to open those doors. We're trying to get that seat at the table. That's that part also of it. You have to care about this other stuff. You, you have you to be out there. Yeah. Contactable. Yeah. Especially in this day and age. It's like no social media is like being dead or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, <laughs> she passed away. <laughs> I'll say that. All right. We gone. <laughs> I got a bed to get into. <laughs> I'll see y'all later. Good night. All right. <laughs> so much i love you guys peace and love like from my heart like i just have such love for everyone here i really do thank you for having me tony thank you for having us it's been just incredible of course much love to you no, and all of y'all for real yeah, yeah we gotta right. get you out here come on now peace bye I'm, I'm gone bye <laughs> <laughs> 
Thanks for tuning in to the True Conversation Podcast, presented by Vulcan. Vulcan would like to offer you a 15% discount at Vulcan.com. Just enter code PODCAST at checkout and a discount will be applied. Peace. Now we in the house cooking up a new plot. First it was stocks, 